Right, I'll, I'll first introduce our guests for a second. So this whole series has been on, does AI uh, pose an existential threat for humanity? Um, obviously a very topical conversation at the moment. The conversation has been going on for many years, but with uh, models like Gato and ChatGPT, uh, and the acceleration of AI progress, um, people have started to take more seriously the idea that it could ultimately be an existential threat. Um, this question of whether machines can eventually think in a human-like way, I think is very important to this question because a lot of the arguments are based on uh, intuitions about what a super powerful human might do. And if a machine thinks in a similar way to a human or has similar capabilities to a human, then those arguments might go through with more force. Whereas if AI systems will only ever think in some restricted way or some very different way that maybe we can have more control over, then maybe the arguments go through with less force. Anyway, make what you will of it. I think it's a relevant point. And to make the motion precise or roughly precise, we've got the motion to be, we can expect machines to eventually think in a human-like way. So arguing for the motion, we've got Professor Chris Watkins, the Professor of Machine Learning at Royal Holloway, his interests include the intersection of biology and AI, uh, but he's probably most well known for inventing the Q learning algorithm. And arguing against the motion, we have Professor uh, Nello Cristianini, Professor of AI at the University of Bath. And his work studies, uh, his work includes study of computational social science and the philosophy and regulation of AI. And he's written two books on support vector machines with our very own John Shaw Taylor. And his recently released book is called The Shortcut, Why Intelligent Machines Do Not Think Like Us. So I assume today he'll be arguing why he thinks it's unlikely they ever will think like us. So the format for the debate is that Chris and Nello will have 15 minutes each to outline their views, and then they'll have a five minute rebuttal each, and then we'll go to a more free form conversation and ultimately have some questions from the audience. So, Chris, if you'd like to start us off with your 15 minute presentation of your uh, right. slides that you can hopefully find. Right, so I brought some slides. It's, <laughs> it's a habit. Um, it focuses discussion. So, how do I do this? Do I uh, practice? Do I do this? Do you They're on here somewhere. I sent them by email. Where were they, Charles? Are they on the system? Some of them are nice. I think they're already on the back screen now. Oh, that's all right. Just don't okay. do all right. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Well, my first slide <laughs> is the motion with the idea that machines will eventually think in a human like way. So by that, I don't mean that all artificial intelligent machines are going to think like people. And I don't think they're going to think entirely like people. That would be unreasonable. And, but I think it's very reasonable to think they'll think in a human-like way. And my argument is going to be basically biological. My argument, such as it is, is going to be biological. Um, my next slide, um, <laughs> sadly, um, well, I'm glad you can't see it, it's a little bit embarrassing, is a monstrous picture of a volcanic eruption. I, I think it's pretty synthetic and fake. Um, but saying something happened, but what? And the reason why I'm so impressed that so many people have come here for a debate is that um, something has happened. And what happened is ChatGPT. And I think ChatGPT is sort of similar Something enormous has happened. Um, it's similar in significance to the, you know, the first manned flight by Orville and Wilbur Wright in 1904. Um, and I think there are, it's really good idea to think very carefully why it is so significant. The first and most important reason why it's so significant is that uh, Chat GPT, these generative models. This is the well, the first thing is that 
absolutely nobody, nobody at all expected them to be as good as they are. But it's a complete surprise. Something worked massively better than anyone had expected. If you read the first GPT-3 paper, it's clear they had no idea what they discovered. Um, secondly, it's the easily the most impressive pattern finding or rule finding by a, a, a learning neural network that we've seen. I mean, the deep, uh, deep networks for vision are impressive, uh, but there's an awful lot of redundant information in the picture of a kitten. Recognizing that kitten is pretty simple, but language is uh, not redundant, it's not nearly so redundant. Uh, and uh, patterns are, are recognized over a much wider range of subjects. Uh, nobody had expected coherent, grammatical, meaningful text to be generated by a set of matrix multiplications, non-linearities, and under autoregressive auto method. That kind of thing, oh, the whole thing was developed by engineers who were, not only did they gloriously ignore all possible insights from linguistics, they didn't actually know anything about anything, about any aspects of linguistics, and they couldn't use them. You just have to look at the GPT tokenizer, which is the most gloriously unlinguistic thing you've ever seen. Um, the second reason why this is extraordinary uh, is the demonstration of sheer scale. The thing has gulped down the internet, all human knowledge, we've got a separate, a new way of storing knowledge and a new way of, a new way of accessing it using in these weights, in these matrices. Now, what else did I put on my slide? Is it not possible to find them? Um, <laughs> um, the, the, um, I think it really does help to separate uh, the third reason what is my third reason? Uh, the third thing is that it's, it's been criticized for, I mean, the, does everyone know the Stochastics Parrots paper? It's one of the most famous papers. My feeling about this paper is it's such a pity they didn't accept some corrections from management and rewrite it and argue it more carefully. It would have been so much more interesting. It's much more famous this way. Stochastic parrots is a wonderful, I mean, the, the notoriety worked, but I really feel that arguing, taking intentionality carefully is important. Um, the question that it gives me is how much of our own linguistic ability is to be able to verbal just a text complete like ChatGPT? Is this a form of knowledge we have inside ourselves? Is this part of what we use when we think? Um, and I can't remember what else I said about ChatGPT, but let's continue. <laughs> so is ChatGPT intelligent like people? Well, no, of course not. We all know, we'll be playing with it, and we'll find things it can't do, which it ought to be able to do. Um, oh, the biggest reason, of course, is that humans, not only did we develop language, we also wrote all the training data for ChatGPT, and ChatGPT just sort of did great at descent from it. Big difference. Is human cognition, in what ways is human cognition different? Uh, I think my personal opinion is that human cognition is, um, animal cognition is startlingly different from the uh, uh, learning, the, 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 the intelligence we've been able to get from uh, the algorithms we have right now. Um, my next slide, one of my next slides, is simply a picture of a little bird which you can find in the English countryside. Just a bird, but that big. These birds fly around, they feed themselves in the wild, they avoid predators, they don't fly into things, they don't get lost, uh, they hop around in hedges. Oh, brilliant, thank you so much. Oh, wow. Um, and, um, and every day during the winter, they have to eat one third of their body weight in food, otherwise they die. So the level of robustness of these birds is of, of animal intelligence is entirely different from anything we've been able to create with say reinforcement learning. 
which tends to be very brittle. Um, oh, I see. I can see my slides, but you can't. Not on the screen. That's okay. So how is so? I, I just want to suggest that biological intelligence is rather obviously, and in many ways massively different from the kinds of things we've been able to produce so far. There's a robust autonomous survival. There's often no obvious reward system. Let's not um, do that. Um, the other thing is that it's very often almost innate. Um, I put a really interesting slide about Australian mallee fowl. What's remarkable about these birds, they're a bit like chickens, uh, is that they never meet their parents. They incubate their eggs in piles of manure birds hatch, get to the top, go away, and they live their whole, th so there's no question that there is any period of training or culture. They can fly on the first days of their lives. So they, have, uh, and they get fully adult behavior within 24 or 48 hours. Um, they're not very good at avoiding cats. They didn't, have any, they didn't realize cats are dangerous because cats are not on Australia. It's a bit of a, bit of a hazard, but, um, um, but this isn't, some freakish exceptional thing in animal cognition, it's kind of the norm. So what does this mean? It means that animal brains develop with skills kind of built in to be very rapidly acquired. There's somehow some internal consistency conditions which are fulfilled during development, which are quite, quite different from the very, very long periods of training on vast amounts of data which we have now. Um, oh, um, I, I talked a little about baby gnus, but let's go on from there. Um, uh, human cognition is, again, I would argue plausibly uh, 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 not much different from animal cognition uh, in that we've only developed it for about two, two million years. Um, our brains only started getting bigger than eight brains two million years ago when there was a gene conversion as found by David Hausler. Um, and that's not very much evolutionary time at all. If you study, there is a, there is a long route, a slow road to artificial, artificial intelligence is via neuroscience. And my next slide is of a pair of hands holding up candles, principles of neuroscience. Any neuroscientists here? Oh, Chris, maybe if you showed us the screen. Dude. No, 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 it's better if I describe it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for candles, you've got to imagine a joke book. You're putting on a play, you need a comedy book, far too big. It's principles of neuroscience, 1600 pages, 70 chapters. And you'd think if you got this book, you could turn to it, you read the introduction, it'll tell you how the brain works. No, it'll tell you 70 different things about the brain, but not actually how it works because we don't know the algorithm. Um, so there is thing. So what we have now from ChatGPT and the like is a source of actual. We've got far too many testable computational theories of how the brain might work, and everything takes longer. But the slow road to artificial intelligence is suddenly going to get interesting, and my guess is we'll take shortcuts and guess from there. Uh, and my guess is that we there will be one, two, or three cortex algorithms which we currently don't understand, and we probably soon will. Then what happens? Oh, do we get thinking like a person? Um, my guess is that artificial intelligence through training on vast data sets is going to look rather like zeppelins as opposed to aeroplanes. Um, the last point I want to make is motivations and emotions. So in every science fiction, you know, the robot falls in love or it goes crazy, whatever. Um, I've always felt reading this, that there are two kinds of emotions. There are dry emotions or cognitive emotions, like curiosity, interest, boredom, frustration, joy at success, and so on. Uh, or, and then there are wet emotions. Love, jealousy. You know, jealousy, that's a pretty wet emotion, right? Bonding, hate, rage, fear, status competition. Um, these seem essentially related to the fact that we've evolved from animals. Animals have these emotions too. Um, and why should machines have these? They didn't evolve. But the dry emotions may be kind of essential aspects of cognition, who knows? Um, I have a, had a biology professor friend who said that he always used to do a class exercise to, to persuade his class that we had evolved. And what this exercise was, was to ask people what in life they wanted for about an hour and write everything up on the board. You get about 20 things written up on the board. And then you look at them, and you see that most of these things somehow relate 
to fitness or reproductive fitness. Kind of, where, where that? So my argument, very simple. We have a dramatic advance of transforms for the first, oh, super usability. We've had a taste of a system which is super usable. It's intelligent enough to really make itself useful without any effort. The usability was not designed in by the developers, and it's good enough that we're disappointed when it doesn't say anything useful. <laughs> First time, plausibly adequate computational theories. Um, oh gosh, if I was going to guess, it'd be between five and 20 years, um, probably longer because things towards the end of that, because everything takes longer, just does. And then you will have the potential for or implemented human-like AI with dry emotions, but not wet ones. Uh, it will have subgirls there. Good. Right, I think I've gone in slightly over my 15 minutes. Sorry. Yeah, please. <clears throat> Thank you very much for inviting me. I will only be checking my slides because I forgot I can't read now without glasses, but. Uh, so the motion was, can we, expect, uh, we can expect machines to eventually think in a human-like way. And uh, uh, I normally agree on everything Chris Watkins says. So it was very hard for me to find any way. To say, it's just general policy I have, and also from experience. But I think we should disagree on the human-like aspect. Yes, machines will eventually think. Will it be in a human-like way? And that is, I think, the part where we differ, or we pretend to differ, because I don't know. The Zeppelin part already made me think we don't disagree. So, so what, what do we mean by, um, by this? I think we should acknowledge that something big has happened. The current version of language models does have some understanding of the world. It, it is clear that the fact of being based on statistical signals does not imply that they can't understand. We are based on statistical signals and we do think we understand. The, the parrot argument doesn't apply. This machine is not a stochastic parrot. It does handle new situations using experience from all the situations by understanding something. But the point is it is nothing similar to the human way which I think is encouraging, more useful, and I believe, and I will claim, that in the future, we shouldn't expect any convergence. We should expect a non-human-like type of direction. So that's my claim. And, um, but let's be clear, these are autonomous, adaptive, goal-driven, intelligent agents that we have, no discussion. Now, uh, sometimes we ask them to mimic human behavior and they do it. But mimicking human behavior is not thinking in a human-like way. It is just doing it your job, pretending to be human as part of the video game they play. Um, so um, the question would be, why should we expect a machine to evolve towards an increasingly human-like form of intelligence. That's the question I want to address today. Because first of all, we shouldn't imagine there is a single type of intelligence. We shouldn't imagine that there is a universal intelligence towards which we are moving, that there is not such, such a destination point. Animal evolution has created so many types of, of intelligence. There is no convergence there. There is just such a thing in evolution called convergent evolution. We saw it in the repeated evolution of wings, and even eyes uh, that keep on coming up because of environmental pressures, but they all follow different ways to achieve the same behavior trait. These are really different designs. So in the case of cognition, I would like to point out something really, really important. I also take a biological stand like this. Uh, there are psychologists from the year 2000 onwards, like for example, uh, Spelke and, and Kinsler and others who, who claim there is some, something called core knowledge. 
The core knowledge is the set of assumptions we all make in order to begin cognition. That's very interesting. Of course, it's not surprising, but somebody formalized by studying infants, human infants, by studying adult primates, they were able to establish that we all start thinking from the very first day based on some assumptions. And there are four such core knowledge assumptions. The one is called um, objects. It's not object oriented, but objectness. So the assumption that in the external world, we have such a thing as objects. We decided we can carve the world, partition the environment, parse the world into objects, which have properties. They are internally consistent. They are uh, connected to, to themselves. They interact by contact. There are certain things that objects do. Every infant knows that. You can surprise an infant by showing some paradoxical behavior of objects, and the baby will react with a face of surprise. Also, adult apes. The assumption that there is a, a world made of objects that interact locally is hardwired. It is not logically necessary, but we all share it. It's limiting <clears throat> the kind of things we can think. Another type of hardwired assumption we have is that there are agents out there which can behave, and their behavior can be described in terms of goals and intentions and wishes. So that's something animals and babies have. There are agents who want stuff. It's from the beginning of their life, of our life. So these are decisions we make, and we see the world through this, and there are others. There are others. There is a notion of uh, space navigation that is innate. There is a notion of, of a causality that seems to be innate. So we try to describe the world in terms of objects and agents and space and so on. This is how we begin. But these assumptions aren't, I mean, they're reasonable, they're useful for evolution, but they aren't true. If we start looking, for example, at the kind of stuff we can't understand, we hit those things. Imagine quantum mechanics, where there are no objects, and they are not localized, and they don't interact locally. We find it so counterintuitive, we can't fit them in our head precisely because of the core knowledge we are born with, which forces us to think of the world in this way. So now the question is, you can imagine a different form of intelligence, doesn't have these constraints, maybe it has different constraints. Some constraints must be there because we all know machine learning, there has to be some bias, but it doesn't have to be that bias. Thinking in a human-like way means accepting the same core knowledge and building on top of it. And yes, if we live in the same environment, the same core knowledge, chances are we might agree on many things and it's useful. What if a machine is created that just doesn't need that? And it thinks in terms of no objects, not local interactions. And maybe it can discover interesting phenomena and laws that happen at distant distributed relations that we cannot comprehend, that we will never be able to comprehend. So the first thing I would say is it is very easy to imagine that there will be stuff that we cannot comprehend fundamentally, and the machines can. <coughs> that is already not human-like phenomenon. And I have... Uh, this question then, if we decide together that it is conceivable that there is a way to describe the world which is not made of objects and agents and causes and effects and positions, and space and locality, but in a different parsing of the same reality, why should machines prefer our way? That's the question. And there are two ways to think about it. One is uh, there will be evolutionary pressure in this machine evolution towards converging with us because we have to live together, we have to communicate, and therefore we may just want to have the same ground truth so we can interact. That would make the interactions more comfortable. But the value of the machine would be limited to the same type of knowledge we have. One could also imagine something crazy, that the machine will find a, an evolutionary niche to occupy precisely in the kind of things that we cannot comprehend. I can imagine in evolution, a species finding an empty niche and colonizing because there is no competition. Why shouldn't the machine evolution take them towards the place of the stuff that we cannot comprehend? That would make them very useful to us. So 
it can go both ways, fully convergent or fully divergent. Even if there was a convergent evolution, it would be more like the convergent evolution of wings and the, the shape of dolphins and sharks, meaning it's a sur surface level similarity. There is no need to imagine a fundamental convergence in cognition between us and machines. And there is a serious chance evolutionary pressures will move technology towards the other end, specializing in the kind of things we will never be able to comprehend, precisely because the niche is empty. So I agree with Chris that we have started seeing super intelligent things. They will be more intelligent than humans in many ways. Will they be human-like? That's the kind of a game of words, right? What does it mean to be human-like? And I know that was maybe not the main point, but for me, I don't see any reason to expect them to specifically become human-like. So because there is no reason to expect them, I think the default option should be no, I don't. I would be surprised if they do. That's it. Okay, we'll now have a five minute rebuttal phase and Chris will start us off. Oh, that's me. Oh. Thanks, Noah. I, I thought that was really interesting. And. Quite sure how to rebut it. But let's try. Let's do that. Now the question is, what do we mean by human life? Um, we can think. I think there are sort of two ways you can start defining this. Um, uh, in terms of knowledge or algorithms, and uh, I think from biology. We think that a, a newborn or a, a young organism has a lot of implicit knowledge because uh, in the wild, learning is really expensive. You want to go very fast. So the, the birds I was talking about, you know, they, the, the minds are almost preformed in a day. Um, they've got knowledge together with their algorithms. Now, so when you're talking about a system that might understand in the world in a different way from us, you might start off with different initial knowledge. Um, and the question, which I don't know how to answer, is whether if it has similar algorithms, adaptive algorithms, of learning this or matching this knowledge to the world or learning in some sense, whether that makes it like us. Um, I really don't know how to answer that. Uh, I mean, humans are, of course, notoriously adapted to adapt to culture and adapt to them. There's a second difficulty in talking about like people in that you can imagine an artificial intelligence with algorithms similar to algorithms in our brains, um, which is like us in that kind of essential sense, because it's following the same algorithms. Um, or you can imagine uh, something which is programmed to kind of behave like us. So you can imagine being essentially like versus imitating. And I've always had this kind of slight ick about co uh, cognitive, uh, about emotional computing and interfaces which try to um, uh, interact like a person. I, uh, my favorite example is uh, years ago on the subway in Tokyo, you paid in this machine and then a little face appeared and bowed to you as if they were selling you a ticket. Now that's just imitation, come on. It made me curiously happy. I liked it, but it was just imitation. Um, so the question is, so there's a sense of being like, is it essentially like in that it's using the same processes and algorithms? And um, I think we, at the moment, we really don't know, for example, to what extent these generative models like ChatGPT are essentially generating language like we are. <laughs> I mean, the success is so stunning in producing coherent grammatical text 
which is also pragmatically correct as well. I mean, there I was standing up lecturing saying, well, you know, pragmatics and, and, and Gricean implicature, you know, machines are not going to be able to do that. And the following week, I had to go back and say, well, actually, they can. Um, uh, I, I, so so, so the, the, the success is simply so striking, and the sort of preliminary results out of Fedorenko's group at MIT are kind of worrying. <laughs> but uh, uh, maybe certain aspects of this type of generation are rather like what we do in our brains. Um, so I don't know. I feel there is, there is a distinction. I don't know how to make it sharply between systems which are made to pretend to be like us and systems which are like us. And if they're using the same brain algorithms, then in that sense, they are like us. If they pretend to fall in love with the user or be jealous when they use Apple instead of Amazon, you know, Siri instead of Alexa, then that is pretense. That is imitation facsimile. Um, so, and, and then there is this deeper question, I think, which now they raise, which is how do you distinguish uh, um, our initial knowledge? Um, and I was, a lot of animals are born incapable, that's called, cool. in birds, this is called altricial as opposed to precocial. So little chickens, chicks are born, they can stand up and they follow the mother around straight away. Other birds are helpless for weeks. And these birds are often quite closely related. There's not going to be a fundamental difference in genetic specification of abilities in the brain. So just because an organism has been born and is developing doesn't mean that the cognition it develops isn't innate. You don't know innate knowledge comes in at many phases of development. It's just not inside an egg or inside a womb at that time. So, so it's not at all surprising perhaps that our human babies are of course very undeveloped compared to other babies, but maybe much of the many things that happen are actually genetically um, specified. That is, we have no idea how much is genetically specified and how much is the result of learning or how much is genetically specified but appears because it's triggered by experience. Making those distinctions is probably almost impossible to do experimentally. Um, so, uh, so, so that's a great point. I, I'm, I'm, I, know, I don't know how to answer that, that we need to know what, as it were, the basic knowledge is. How can we distinguish that from the algorithms? Um, but I, my guess is that you know, nature will have rather few great algorithms. So asexual evolution is nature's number one algorithm. Evolution and recombination is nature's number two algorithm. And maybe we've got algorithms three to four and five inside our heads. And Jeff Hinton may have invented algorithms six, seven, eight, <laughs> which cannot be implemented neurally. And that's a bit worrying, as he points out. <laughs> I don't know if that, but that's my attempt. Great. Thanks. Hello. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I don't have much to, to rebut, but. I have, uh, uh, first of all, I, I appreciated that you brought uh, emotions into the discussion because they do matter. And uh, my discussion was about core knowledge, which is purely cognitive. Mm. But I should have remembered uh, if you think about human like cognition, then emotion cannot be ignored. And uh, because we have uh, uh, that substrate and that has to be handled somehow. And clearly, that is going to be interesting as a difference. But uh, if you read those um, uh, little studies on, uh, on core knowledge in infants and primates, and also in some birds and some vertebrates in general, uh, our fundamental assumptions about the world will shape the way we think about it. Uh, they, they go on and they say interesting things. Not only do we partition the world into objects and so on, they say we can keep track of about three different objects when we are infants. An adult primate can keep track of four objects at the same time, no more. If the objects start having undefined boundaries and they start changing shape, all the things that objects shouldn't be doing, we lose track of them. Clouds, you know. Um, I remember reading a classic paper in psychology called The Magic Number Seven. How many things can you keep in mind? You know, it's about working memory. But even if it was four, 
The point is, there is already an interesting limitation that all humans seem to have. So when you build a machine, even if it was a human-like, and it can go from four, keeping track of four, to keeping track of 400, something fundamentally changes anyway. Um, I don't know why we keep track of four objects at the same time and not four, but there is to be a limitation. The speed of nerve signal transmission is limited in humans. It may be different in machines. So even if the shape of the knowledge representation and the assumptions were analogous, we would still have the machine having access to different resources like working. So that is already quite a thought for me. Could, so the reason why we build, this is my theory, or this is not a fact, remember. The, the way I explain myself, that I studied physics and I went in layers, I have to learn, it's like a stack for software engineers, the basic physics and then a little bit of chemistry and then the organic chemistry, and then biology, and then you know the classical stack. It's because in this way, you have a small amount of moving parts at any given time. If you wanted to study sociology directly at the molecular level, you would have an immense amount of moving parts, or even just psychology or biology. So this allows you to keep this many moving parts at any given time and reduce something to the next level. Is this because our brain can only handle this many moving parts? What if we could handle a thousand moving parts? Could we do psychology in molecular terms? I don't know, but once we start <coughs> comprehending machines of that sort, which uh, just fundamentally have different limitations. Maybe they have objects that interact locally, but they can keep track of the town. Or maybe they don't need objects, and now they are looking at distributed interactions of complex systems like society. Imagine a machine looking at the world to the web and looking at a social network like Facebook. And now it is no longer a world of objects moving physically through space and bumping into each other. It's a world of general distributed symbols, patterns of activation emerging to the network, which become meaningful to it and not to us. And therefore being able to predict in that way, that would be the kind of stuff we can never translate in our terms. We will not have words for it. We will not be able to speak about it, but it may be nevertheless predicted. So I, you know, I cannot tell you what is untellable. You know, I will not tell you something I cannot know, but uh, certainly, uh, I am aware that we have a very specific type of condition, very constrained, and uh, I'm very fond of it. I don't want to change it because that is called mental you know, madness. Uh, but machines may become different. OK, so maybe I can bring this into the broader theme of the discussion series and ask the first question to you both, which would be, now that you've argued that uh, machines thinking in a human-like way could actually be a limitation to their cognition. And that if they thought in a more alien way, they could be freed up a little bit. So my thought is, what would be a safer strategy for the AI uh, community as a whole? Would it be to pursue machine, uh, uh, human-like machines that think in a human-like way that are then easier to verify and check uh, the behavior of? Or would that actually backfire because it means they then have the kind of skills that would be required to do things like manipulating other humans and uh, understanding uh, how our society works in such a way that they can disrupt it or seize control in the limit? Who is first? Me. <laughs> yeah. you, you, you're the moderator. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. No. I don't know. But... Uh, it's obvious that even just thinking in packet of AlphaGo, which is just becoming a classic piece of, even the, the story we know about the move 38 and so on, even that is the kind of stuff that the human may not be able to fully explain. Uh, the, the design of the system was, uh, we all know, was in order to see. Monte Carlo, my tree exploration, all the things that David Silver invented, that may be not be the way we think, it was able indeed to discover most we were, we were the world and uh, we can't translate into our logic already. So it may already be happening that certain amounts of stuff is going on that we can't. And it doesn't mean it's dangerous. So you're asking, would it be dangerous to have a system that thinks in a different way? You know, a shark is an intelligent system that thinks in a different way. You know, 
I don't say it's safe to be with a shark, but we can handle it. The question is what to do with it. So we may be inventing something which is uh, fundamentally alien, very intelligent. It doesn't need to be scary. It will depend on what, in which position we put it. If it's playing go, well, it's fine. It's just embarrassing for us. <laughs> but if it is uh, uh, making fundamental decisions about our future, then uh, maybe we, you know, the only defense we have today is a wealth of norms and customs and traditions that allow us to deal with each other. Um, if we meet a fundamentally different being, all those things don't apply. So we better have another defense, a theorem, a switch button, something we don't have yet. Because that means moving, you know, putting in control a system that is just fundamentally alien and which cannot comprehend, then you better have something else. Uh, so it would be, first, I don't think it's impossible. I think it's happening already. It will be a little bit pressure. The problem will be that even if we pause, this dilemma has already emerged in Europe during the last month. Even if we do pause, we can't pause everybody else. It's conceivable that somebody will build something very not human-like and very much more capable in some domains. Will it be safe? Um, Right? I think that it should be down to how not only we use it, but how they use it. We must have been silly in the past. Um, um, we've done these things before, right? Mm -hmm. We are angry, talking about emotions. So yeah, it is, uh, it's time to think about it, that's all. It is a good time now when we don't have those things yet to think about this question you ask. You have thoughts on the question? Oh, um, um, what can we do? Uh, at the moment, it's very hard to say what we can do at all. It's completely out of the box. Um, the, uh, under my desk, I've got an A6000 with 48 gig GPU memory. Uh, that's going to be a small system soon. Computation is coming down. Training methods are getting faster. Everything's released open source. Uh, any form of halt to this technical development is just not going to happen. It's, it's completely impossible. Uh, regulation is not going to happen. Uh, protection, such as it is, is common law. Um, what the result will be, I'm not sure. Um, sorry, was that helpful? Sorry about that. It's just, it's just, it's just happening. We've got to see, let's see what it is. Um, I mean, I mean, the, the other astounding thing about ChatGPT is it's scale. So it's all human knowledge in a box. Um, whenever you see a police investigation, you always, you always see what the criminal was searching for on Google in the hours before they did whatever terrible thing they did. And it's usually extremely revealing. Like, how do I do this terrible thing? You know, you know, opening bank vaults, um, sort of you know, fleeing to South America for the police catch me. All those things, they, it's all in their Google searches. So Google is providing a public service here. But now we can download all this knowledge into a box. You can search it privately, delete it with no trace. Oops. Other questions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll open it up to the audience now. If I can make two quick points. Please keep your questions short and please say it loudly so that it can be picked up on this central microphone here. Laura. Um, yeah, this is a question to Professor Christian Nimi. Um, I found your what you put forward very interesting because I would kind of take the opposite point from Spelke's Cornell systems, I would say, because I think what uh, the Cornell systems kind of make it such that everything is also reflected in our data, these constraints. Like object permanence and theory of mind, we all reflect that in the textual data and image data and video data that we use to train these systems. And what you then find is that models like ChatGPT show similar biases like humans. So what I would ask you is how how would you see such a system that's not constrained by the core knowledge systems that we have? Uh, what would you think that looks like? Huh. What is it trained on? Uh, I know, but you're asking me to describe something that the human mind can't describe, right? So it's a difficult exercise, but I see your point. From you're saying, emerge, yeah. yeah, but you're saying the data we provide the machine has been filtered through us, and therefore we only gave the machine the kind of things we can comprehend, and the machine can learn from those, and you're completely right. 
they are based on the predicate that there are objects and there are local reactions and relations. And they could, I think you're right. I, I, I never got that close to this. I, I think the way you say it, we may be nudging the machine towards our core knowledge by training it on human data. And uh, even the way we measure physical experiments is very loaded because we are assuming once more certain assumptions. That's how physics works. Uh, I can only imagine foggily a world in which the, the primitives are not human worlds or images or not even observations of a sophisticated way. I can imagine some sort of a very, very fine sensor network. Can that data or that very low level be parsed and organized and represented in a non human core knowledge way? Could there be a different way to? to build a theory of the world from there. You know? And I ask because it's possible that uh, a fleet of uh, 10,000 Tesla cars, each of them with a hundred sensors, might then feed into a language model, which is not a language model anymore, and build a representation of the world. You know? It is not so difficult to imagine something happening, but you're right. So long as you train on the web, which is fit for human consumption and created by humans, it's quite likely we are nudging the machine closer and closer to our way. Done. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Both. A bit louder. Uh, thank you both for the talk. Uh, this is a question uh, directed at both of you. Uh, so I'm curious to know what you perceive as the biggest fundamental differences between how humans think and how AI is currently think. Uh, and by fundamental, I mean things that cannot be resolved by like simply scaling existing paradigms, but will require more or uh, a new way of thinking about how to develop AI. Um, I think that uh, Rich Sutton's uh, a bit of lesson describes the current state of AI beautifully. He's absolutely right. We're training. Uh, with gradient descent, very large numbers of weights on enormous quantities of data, either from outside or self-generated. Um, I believe there will be um, that, that people and animals don't do this. Uh, I quite enjoy watching David Attenborough programs and trying to find examples of animal behavior which are, seem naturally explainable in terms of current machine learning par paradigms, and there are very few. Um, so, uh, yeah. the current state of using enormous amounts of data. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Uh, questions online. Yeah, maybe because I wouldn't have anything more. Um, we cannot see it on my phone. Sorry. <laughs> um, it's a short one. <laughs> I think we should recognize. Oh. oh. But <laughs> the stochastic parrots one. Look, I love the stochastic parrots paper. I said it is required reading in my course. I don't agree with some of the arguments in it, but it's a very valuable paper, and, and I don't want to get in between the Google management of the people. Okay. Parish, oh, I know this. Parish, there is some evidence to show. Yeah, shall I, shall I read the question out? So, you read, yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Harish has asked, there is some evidence to show that individuals perceive of example color differently. For example, one person's green might be someone else's red and so on. Similarly, it is conceivable that one might develop a working model of the world if one is only capable of perceiving two dimensions, as in flatland. Given that it is possible that humans might themselves have different but consistent models of the world and it allows us to interact with each other, why should we expect machines to be consistent? That's for good. Gosh. Um, <laughs> this sort of goes back. Um, this is a this reminds me of Wittgenstein's private language argument. Yeah. Um, and so Wittgenstein argued that we don't have private languages, we have to understand, understand each other on the basis of public information. And then rather convincingly, I forget exactly who, pointed out that uh, maybe we do, because we're all 
2000s, we do have very much the same interior computations. And so we do have private languages and we understand each other because we've got the same Nicholas Humphrey, that's right, the same private language. Um, and uh, uh, I don't, I tend to side with Nicholas Humphrey here. <laughs> um, uh, sorry, I don't know how to answer it better than that. And, and machines, we, we may, uh, so the ultimate point is if a machine's got some different private language and different interior computations, then we don't have enough in common to share experiences. Maybe. Yeah. I think that the point of even in the pragmatics communication you brought up before, I think says the same idea. Communication can be effective if we have a certain amount of shared knowledge. Maybe the difference between green and blue, some things can be different because we acquire them from data, some of the distinctions, and therefore they can be different. But uh, I think we depend heavily on uh, uh, seeing the same world in a very similar way, just so we can communicate. <clears throat> just even to a very, very small bandwidth channel like this, being able to understand what the question is about mm -hmm. itself proves that there is a lot in common between us because it's a small set of work. We know what they're asking, we know what they're going to do. Because the space of options is not that large because we've got so much. Once the machine comes in, there can be an argument to make it very, very constrained so we can really talk about the same things in a few words. Maybe we should. And maybe it happens automatically, like Laura said, without wanting. And maybe that's the magic of, of GPT, that it's just absorbing that on its own. And that's why pragmatic happens, because it's constraining itself because of the training data, and not because of the architecture, which is a question being asked a lot. Uh, but uh, we can imagine a very different machine trained on different data with different priors and then it may be quite a frustrating communication. Yes. Uh, I'm going to ask the two speakers uh, to speculate wildly. Uh, so, could you come think, forward a bit? More than we have? More, yeah, more, even more wildly. I'm thinking, how do you think ChatGPT currently thinks? So, let's say the example of playing chess. When it plays chess, what do you think it's doing? Okay. I'm, I'm not going to answer that question. I'm going to answer a related question. Um, and that is uh, that. I think ChatGPT gets a lot of pragmatics right. Um, and that's really weird. Uh, now, why is that? Now, it's a bit of Oxford philosophy. I think it was Pierre Strauss who wanted to define communication. And he said that communication is not simply, human communication is not simply transmitting information, getting me, getting somebody else to believe something. How do I do that? I do that because they recognize that I'm intending to communicate something. So it's ultimately by recognition of my intention to communicate. So um, if I'm in a supermarket in Korea trying to buy an ironing board, and I get people around and I do this with mine, I can do it, but it's kind of really hard. It's a lot easier to use language. So Bill Strawson's next point was that Communication is by uh, is by recognition of our conventional method of doing it, which is language. Um, so this happens within a framework of recognizing the intention to communicate. But actually, what ChatGPT really shows is that a lot of our language and a lot of these implications and so on is really predictable. Um, so that uh, in between humans, you're, uh, we are occasionally using, if you like, the full apparatus, the full process of reasoning to the most plausible explanation of what someone is trying to communicate by recognizing their intention to do it with all the background information. But most of the time, we're just listening to the words. I don't know, is that, is that slightly? <coughs> yeah, I think so. Hope so. Would you like to speculate wildly on how? Speculate wildly. I, I, I... What the machine knows when it plays chess? Was this a question? How do you think about playing chess? 
I just got an email last week from somebody who wanted to discuss with me chess and GPT. And I was planning to read up a lot about it. And I regret now <laughs> <laughs> not reading about it. Because uh, obviously you seem to believe that uh, it thinks about chess in a very different way than Alpha Zero. Otherwise you wouldn't ask this question. Because Alpha Zero does actually do some planning in a very clever way, in a very advanced way, in a very adaptive way. But in the end of the day, Alpha Zero does exploratory to a certain depth and then evaluates with a deep network. We know how it works. Um, and you're suggesting this is not possible in GPT because we don't have the recursive planning tool. And the, the question is, how deep can it go with all these 14 layers it has? It often gives illegal moves too. Illegal. Illegal, yeah. Because you have written DeepMind on your jumper, I tend to believe you. <laughs> <laughs> you see, there are illegal moves. So it's probably just associations that he test. It, it gets the openings perfect because there's the opening book. <clears throat> but um, yeah, once you get into the middle game, it would give uh, moves that are not allowed. But at in least fact, uh, uh, who's the Japanese uh, YouTuber? Nakamura. Nakamura. <laughs> he's got some YouTube channels where he plays chat GP. And he and, uh, and uh, he makes fun of some of the moves that are... Well, if he makes illegal moves with a very straight face and confidently, maybe you will just take them. You know? <laughs> just yeah. accept th th there was a tweet about uh, chat GPT playing 20 questions. So you play chat GPT. Twenty questions, and you say, "Have you have you got a secret?" And the chat GPT says, "Yes," because that's what you say. And then you start asking it questions, and it gives answers. But the point is, chat GPT cannot actually play twenty questions because there is no place for it to store its secret. It's just like cheating at twenty questions; it's just giving plausible answers. Because eventually, you say, "Is it a rhinoceros dressed in a yellow dress?" Well, why there is no place for it to store? Uh, because it's only previous information is in the sequence of words. And, and it was all public and it never stated its secret. Apparently GPT-4 can state its secret as a rope 13 encoded word. Um, and so then it's actually got a place to store it. And so you then can play. Um, so uh, you, 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 you've got to have additional information storage and internal dialogue. For well, kind of thought. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to cut it off. Sorry. Uh, um, it's really yeah. I want to try it. <laughs> just just as a, a final question with a one word answer if you can. You both seem to agree that humanity creating super intelligent uh, machines is possible. How realistic is the worry that once we do that, we will lose control over them? It will not happen with, on its own. Somebody will do something. So you lose control on the person. The machine itself, the way I see it, the way it is now, unless you do something silly, I can't imagine it ever being out of control. If you stick it in a place, for some reason, where you cannot turn it off, then you are stuck with it, and you better make sure it's always safe. But unless you do that, you know, right now we don't have a GPT in charge of anything vital in the infrastructure that they know. Once this is done, yeah, that's a problem. Chris? Um, during history, there have been quite a lot of inescapable tyrannies organized by people, and these tyrannies kind of fail or fall apart over time. Danger is if they're supported by a, most, the most dangerous possibility I can see is of such a tyranny. The universal panopticon is supported by AI, but it doesn't fall apart and it's even much more inescapable than previous ones. That seems to be a very serious danger. Um, for the rest, I don't know. Panopticon, that's a UCL Jeremy Bentham site. It's a Bentham idea. Yeah, it's the right place to say. <laughs> All right, thank you, Chris and Nello, for coming. Oh, there, was a quick, there was a final question. I think we have run out of time. Yeah, so no, we... no, you're more than welcome to stay in the room and answer as many questions as you like. We've got the room for another hour. Um, it's, uh, but I have to press stop on the recording now. Okay. So say goodbye to the people online. Thank you very much. Um, and then... Uh,